I am uh, Tudalani Asino uh, from Oklahoma State University, uh, and I am very happy to be here with you to have uh, this conversation, this dialogue on um, how to recenter, reframe, and own dialogues around um, educational technologies and emerging technologies and creativity in um, in education. So. Um, I'm hoping that this will not be uh, a formal classroom lecture, that we will actually be having a conversation and dialogue as we go on. So, all right? So, do you mind if I sit? It's fine. It's all right. Fine. I keep looking at the, at the wall as if that there's somebody there. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. <clears throat> so, um, I'm going to start this off, uh, our slide here is just a quick guide of what I'm hoping that we'll do in this dialogue. I'm going to start off with a little bit of sh sharing with who I am and how I come to this conversation because I think it's important for you to at least know um, where I've been and where my education is from so that you could judge whether or not or you can make a judgment on, on what I'm saying, uh, sort of giving a bit of my pers positionality. Um, and again, I'm hoping that this will be uh, a conversation. And for me, the main takeaway that I really would like to uh, to argue here, and what I've been arguing in, in, in previous talk, is that um, African scholar and uh, African practitioners are contributing to the conversation when it comes to uh, areas of um, educational technologies. Uh, for, for some who have been active in that space, that might seem fairly obvious and self-explanatory, but I think it, it bears repeating because uh, we have, I think, internalized certain things that I don't think are really useful, and um, people outside the continent have internalized certain things about African contribution that I feel I can check. check. Um, so um, that's sort of one of the main takeaways. Uh, but before I do that, I want to sort of start situating the conversation because often one of the things that um, I get asked about is um, why I spell um, Africa with a K uh, and how uh, that, that, that um, sort of fits sort into, of into my whole, my whole conversation, conversation around, around, around um, um, the topic of, 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 of uh, learning design and technology in education. So, um, as I said earlier, I am uh, working in the U.S., but I am I was born in Vinduk in Namibia, which is where I uh, grew up between Vinduk and the northern part uh, of Namibia, uh, Ongajera. Um, that's where I spent my formative years and also uh, some years in um, in New York. Uh, my first language is is um, and the more I've started to sort of come into, um, come into being, into who I am, I had a, uh, a professor of mine um, say something that really stuck with me, where he says that you should, um, we should stop entering our houses through the gates that somebody else has built for us. And that has stuck with me in terms of when I, as I try to uh, make sense of my identity and reconceptualize um, who I am. And one other thing that kept coming up for me is I don't know of a single word in my language that has C as a letter in it. Um, and I have a tough time finding any African language that has C as uh, one of the, um, the, 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 the letters that's common in the, uh, um, in, in, in the language. Uh, and most African languages sort of spell Africa with a K. It's only when we convert this to English that we make this conversion. So um, for me, I started the question like, well, why am I writing it this way if this is not what my language, uh, my linguistic origin is? So this wasn't for me to really be provocative or, or, or anything or, or some sort of backlash towards the English language. It was just me kind of making sense of this. Um, but as I went on, for me, really the case sort of started to to stand for reclaiming, uh, reclaiming my own narrative, uh, reclaiming uh, my position in, in the discourse that I'm engaged in. 
Um, so for me, as long as I spell the word Africa, I'm always going to spell with a K because that's um, a part of, of, of who I am and my identity and my language. So it's not at all to um, imply that um, everybody should do it that way, but I do know that there is a larger conversation uh, that started as early with people uh, um, such as uh, Marcus Gabby, who actually argued for uh, uh, a spelling uh, with a K. Uh, but mine really started off much more just as, uh, um, um, as a, a way of making sense of my own identity. So, uh, how do I come to this conversation? Um, I'm currently, as I said earlier, at Oklahoma State University. I did uh, a dual PhD at Penn State in learning design and technology and comparative international education. Before that, I was uh, working in student affairs, um, uh, residence life, uh, and uh, at Cabrini College where I also got a master in instructional um, systems design. Uh, so I was uh, trained as an instructional designer. And before that, I was at uh, Duquesne University, uh, where I did my studies in media studies, political science, multimedia, and corporate um, uh, communication. So I like to usually present this because all of these things, uh, both spaces and training, have sort of have uh, significantly had an influence on my thinking and how I come to to conversations. So. There's a few things that drives me. Um, I'm very passionate about design and designers, and that talk, that, that um, includes design of tools, design of learning environment, design of learning spaces, uh, and so on, and just design of everyday things, which can be very problematic because you can be walking through them all and notice some of the most um, crazy designs that sort of throws you off. Um, day in and day out, I'm trying to make sense of um, what is broadly called educational technology, but what in my program is called learning design and technology. Um, I'm trying to make sense of what innovation in education looks like. Um, and on top of that, I'm also really obsessed with how ideas and innovations are diffused uh, across context. Um, I'm a big believer in, in this notion that uh, education should be borderless. Um, so when we s focus on educating our students or saying our children, um, I usually like to push back and say that often um, the people who um, influence the rest of the world are from communities that we have never met. Um, you have people all around the world being influenced by um, Nelson Mandela, but I, I'm fairly certain that when he was a kid being taught in South Africa, People, when they're talking about educating our children, they probably were not including him. So we have to sort of rethink this idea of what education our children looks like and our students look like because those students end up influencing the world over. Um, so what is the point between all of this and, and how this connects to, um, to this composition and, and, and what I do? Um, I'm a comparativist researcher, so these are sort of the areas in the world where my, uh, I do my work. Um, <clears throat> I believe that learning is socially constructed, uh, and I really believe that uh, culture is a significant and important part of, um, of our learning processes. Um, I do believe that technology is more than just a tool today that, uh, especially in education, has become an extension uh, of who we are. Uh, just think about the last time you left your phone at home and how great your day went after the head. Um, so I believe that learning is a partnership. Uh, and for me, it's usually a partnership between the learner, um, the, the teacher, and the learning environment. Often, um, what is a teacher and what is a learning environment changes. Uh, and also, our ideas of who is a um, a student often changes as well, but overall, I think learning itself is a partnership. Um, I again, I'm a comparativist, so I'm really more interested in how phenomenon um, manifests itself in one context and how they do it in, in another. Um, I'm very much interested in um, taking lessons from one context and how they can be applied to the other. And I also believe that learning about how other people educate and do things helps me learn a lot about how I do uh, thing and informs my own practice. 
So that is a bit of um, of background, <coughs> which for me brings me to this. Um, if you have attended a past presentation, you might have seen some of the next few slides um, before, and this is where my conversation usually starts. Um, as I continue to travel, um, and, 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 and not just traveling in terms of, uh, of space, but in terms of my own journey as a human being, I'm more and more recognizing that for a lot of people, being an African is never enough. Um, so for me, the idea of just being an African without justification seems to be a foreign concept to some. And what I mean by that is, um, this is my, what I call my nonsense conceptual of uh, African history. At one point, somebody decided that, you know, the Africans needed to be colonized so that they can be civilized. And then when civilized came and we were all good with it, we needed to be protected from our civilizers. And then when those civilizers, um, we needed to be independent from, um, from now the people who came to protect us from our civilizers. And then once we became independent, we needed to be reawakened from our independence so that we can be decolonized. And then, and then, and then, and then, and then. So there's always this idea that um, uh, uh, as an African, you're always in a constant style of being and never being enough. Um, that is for me sort of how I've seen um, uh, uh, Africa as, as a whole has been conceptualized. Um, and for me, that is a bit problematic because it sets up this narrative that every African country is developing, no matter what um, economic um, size it has. I did this at a conference once uh, in the US, and I asked people, um, can you name one European country that is developing? And nobody could name one. So, um, and can you name one country in Africa that is developed? No one can. Uh, um, can name one. So this idea that Africa is always constantly worse off than anybody else seems to have permeated um, so many um, different spaces. Um, it positions Africa in um, a subordinate role or submissive role where everybody else is um, has something to, uh, to teach. So again, why does this matter? especially in the context of somebody who is in educational technology and in the learning design and technology space. Um, I usually, I, I'm obsessed with these things, not because I'm trying to make myself feel better that I have more to contribute, but I think it's, it's important because these ideas have also permeated the educational field. And even in the educational technology field, where now um, uh, a lot of even students are internalizing them. When we don't question that narrative, we end up missing innovative solutions from our own uh, context, from our own students. And I usually like to show this this um, uh, this slide here because it's based on a story that um, of research I was doing in the northern part of Namibia, where I took um, an iPad to uh, uh, to a school. And I asked this, uh, we were doing design act exercises, design activities, and I asked a student, I said, well, if I gave you an iPad, what would you do with it? Uh, and one student said, well, if you gave it to me, I'll throw it in a dustbin because I don't need it. Uh, because you told me that it needs electricity and it needs um, Wi-Fi signal and internet, and I don't have any of that in my village, so I'm going to throw it out. And another student said, well, if you gave it to me, I'll cut a little corner in the right bottom there and pour petrol in it. And then I'm going to use petrol to start um, to start my iPad. Uh, initially, when I heard that, I started to sort of laugh. But the more I, uh, I sort of unpack and examine that, the more I thought how brilliant that is. Because for that student, um, every sort of mechanical technology in his community is powered by some sort of um, gasoline. And for him, if you gave him enough resources, that's what he will do because that is what is valuable and prevalent in his um, uh, community. So um, these type of, 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 of ideas can only come from someone who is um, from that context. The other part here is that um, if we do not re-examine this idea of 
um, of Africa as a constant recipient of solutions and not a place where solutions come from, we also uh, end up promoting an idea of not belonging. And this is an example of another study I was doing on how students um, understand and make sense of science. And uh, one of the questions, one of the prompts was, uh, give me an explanation of what science is and what entrepreneurship is. Um, and the students were giving a very, very beautiful example when they were talking about it in English. So I asked them, okay, can you translate this to me? What, are science, what is science in Ashwambo, which is your local language? Um, and one student said, well, for me, science is, is what white people do. Um, so what was happening in, 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 in this study and in this context is that students were developing a dual understanding of scientific concepts. One is based on uh, the textbook knowledge, um, but very little that can be done to sort of transfer that knowledge to their specific context and how to, to solve solutions, um, I mean sol solve problems in their own community. Um, so my argument is that when we are not um, carefully examining some of these um, concepts that might be outside of the educational technology context, we miss uh, some of these uh, um, innovative ideas from our students, from our community, and we end up promoting um, a narrative of not belonging. The reason, another reason for me why this is, um, is important is that when we talk about, especially in the area of um, technology in education, um, I'm arguing that a lot of the things that we're facing today, we're all facing at the same time. Um, I like to call that uh, an equi-exposure age. I'm arguing that we are living in a time and space where um, we are by and large being impacted and affected by the same things at the same exact time. So an example of that is I can tweet now in, in Cape Town and somebody else on the other side of the world can hear uh, the same exact thing. Um, and innovation that happens in, um, in Vendor can be used in, um, in Washington, D.C. at the same exact time. So we're being exposed to things at the same exact time. Um, so what does that mean? What that means is that, uh, especially in the context of learning with technology, we have access to all these things at the same exact time. What is different is that we might not have to all be able to afford this at the same exact time all over the place. But by and large, um, whether you are in Africa, Europe, Asia, or any other continents, you are probably having a conversation about augmented reality. You're probably talking about virtual reality and how that, uh, especially in a higher education environment, you probably have heard of 3D printing and you're trying to figure out how that fits into your context. Um, and you're probably trying to, to talk about simulation and the changing nature of learning and so forth. All these things for me, I argue, are impacting us at the same exact time. The major issue is really about cost. The major issues are maybe about infrastructure that are able to, um, to support some of these things. So, I'm challenging this notion of developing versus develop and asking whether or not in a lot of these concepts that are in a lot of these spaces where things are impacting at the same time, does that notion really make any sense or make any difference anymore? Uh, and what is, what is it, its purpose? So again, we're facing everything at the same time. And what we are all really concerned about in education in general is how do we maximize the impact of the tools that we have? How do we maximize the impact of educational technology? How do we make sense of all these emerging technologies? And how do we transform the very nature of teaching and learning in our spaces? Um, I would argue that all of these are important concepts for consideration, whether you're at Oklahoma State University or you're at uh, uh, University of Cape Town. So we are also trying to make sense of what is the uh, purpose of education? What does it mean to be an educated individual? Um, these are all concepts and questions that we are being exposed to uh, at the same exact time and making sense of. So whether you are uh, 
in Namibia or you are in Nepal, you probably have a national carrier, um, an, an airplane that needs to be flown. So um, a student in every, uh, you have students in every country that are trying to figure out how to fly a plane that need to know all the complexity of, a, of an airplane regardless of where they are. You have students who need to uh, learn how to service even the most expensive of cars. We're exposed to all these things, um, again, at the same exact time. We're all, I would argue, trying to make sense of change that is, uh, um, that is facing us, uh, trying to make sense of how the nature of work is, is changing. The picture on the, on the left there is an online picture of um, an operation theater in the 1900s. Um, and present day uh, on, the, on the right. The argument that um, some scholars have made is that if you take a doctor from a picture on the left and put them in the picture on the right, they're probably going to have to have they're probably going to have a little bit of a hard time readjusting to that space. But if we move that to education space, um, you can take a teacher from the 1800s, they're probably going to be able to pick up where they left off in the present day. So um, these are the type of things that we're trying to make sense of. Uh, how, What does transformation in education mean? Uh, does that mean we have to transform it, transform at a fast pace as other industries or not? What does it mean to be a learner in this age compared to the past? These are all things that we're trying to figure out globally no matter where you are. So the theme here of, the, of, 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 of what I'm hoping will be a dialogue, um, knowing that I've been talking for way too long and for us not to be really having a conversation, is how do we then re-center uh, and reframe and own some of these dialogues so that um, we are not constantly being positioned in the way of uh, being recipient of solution and actual, uh, what's more accurate, active contributors um, to the global narrative on transformation of education. Um, that's what I really would love for us to spend some time going on. Uh, if you think about education um, today, these are really some of the stuff that everybody, I shouldn't say everybody, most uh, education systems are talking about, right? Um, all of these different concepts. But they're not always being had in such a way that we are examining what they mean um, to, uh, uh, to to different contexts. Um, I was having a, a, a conversation about this in, in, in Bindook last week when someone started talking to me about 21st century skills. And I asked the question, what does 21st century skills mean for the Namibian context? Um, and I haven't really gotten a, an answer to that, but we can cite the 21st century skills from, for example, from US documents and what it means there. Are we then uh, assuming that all they are transferable. Um, but we're also having conversation about openness, open education, open educational resources. And we're all using those things in a lot of different ways. Um, and I'm arguing that there could be a lot of cross-pollination between different um, groupings if we can share some of those informations um, uh, across context. Again, uh, this is, I'm going to skip this, but just sort of um, showing some of the, uh, the technologies that we are all uh, facing at the same exact time. So if we're all facing um, the same things at the same exact time, um, then what is it, some of the things that we need to think about as we're trying to reconceptualize, reimagine um, this conversation? What I'm arguing here is that um, Often, what is impacting us in this conversation is what, I, uh, is what is these three things that are holding us back. So, and I'm going to explain this a little bit. So, whenever um, a new technology comes about, we usually talk about it in terms of the capability and capacity. And we say, well, um, in, in my work around M learning, one of the biggest debates was, well, people can't learn from, uh, from cell phones because they're too small. Uh, the screen size is too small. They can't do that. Um, 
the processing power of a small phone is not good enough. You can't do all these computing, um, uh, computing, uh, all these computational things that you need to do. Eventually, what ends up happening is that the technology catches up. Right, you, you used to have the cell phone that was this big and uh, or an antenna hit picking out of your car, but eventually it comes up and it becomes smaller. So what I'm arguing that is that the capability of the technology is an issue that we always end up overcoming, even if it maybe takes a while. The next thing that we actually end up uh, arguing about is like, well, no, it's cost. You, you're. Um, Someone pushed back at me on, on this presentation uh, on a similar topic a while back. I said, well, you're talking about all these things, but um, in my context, in my community, it costs a whole lot of money to be able to put all these tools that you're talking about in the village that I'm even trying to set up an electrical grid and so on. Um, you know, uh, that's, that's, that's too much for me. I'm not going to be able to, I don't believe that we're facing the same thing at the same exact time. What I usually argue is that the cost of the technology um, and the cost of the training that's required, we always end up solving that, right? The more something ends up become massively available, the often the cost becomes less. So we always end up um, eventually uh, resolving that part. The part, however, that we always end up not figuring out how to resolve is the people component. Uh, we're really, and it, and it's, and it, it manifests itself in, in a lot of different ways. One could be um, a, a re, um, I don't want to say a failure, but an inability to imagine a possible future um, that does not involve what you already know. We often talk in our field in terms of integrating new tools in our practice, but the, the problem and the challenge with integrating is that you have to integrate it to what already exists. And if what already exists is, is initially problematic, then what is that integration going to, to do for you? So I'm arguing that this is the part that we end up usually not um, having a, a really tough time um, resolving um, that part. And this is, again, another conceptualization of how I, I, I make sense of this. Often. When you think about innovations in, especially in education, I usually like to break those up into three uh, areas: barriers, promises, and realized values. Um, when you look at this in terms of M learning, specifically learning with mobile devices, um, the barrier often is what people talk about. Well, the finances; it's too costly. Um, you know, I'm reminded more and more every time I'm home how expensive internet is. Um, uh, because you're, you're, you're paying a per megabyte fee. Um, connectivity, device variability, system uh, sizes, screens, access, and all these type of things, we, we see them as barriers. Uh, but we also look at it in terms of the promise. So this is where we really dream big and we say, you know, you can have any time, anywhere learning. You can have uh, uh, learners uh, 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 learning in situ. You can have flexibility uh, and all these different appeals. So, but what we usually have less of is the realized value, and realized value for me is when we actually are able to to show um, examples of these things succeeding, um, where certain promises have actually been realized, where you have collaboration across context, replication <coughs> of studies, and so on. But what ends up happening in this conceptualization is that um, when you knock down these barriers, the realized value section um, expands more and more. Um, however, the more you expand these realized value, the more you're also seeing what other possibility could be. So the more promises that come up, right? So at the end, you also then end up being caught in this sort of um, a, a loop because the more you actually produce and realize the value of whatever innovation you have, the more you should be able to think about newer, uh, new ideas. I, will, um, I know not everybody is a fan of the, um, of the pie because some people prefer a different visualization, but for me this is how uh, I make sense of that and I would love to hear some feedback on that. So how do we, how do we um, reconceptualize and reimagine uh, and what is the role of us uh, especially in the higher education space. I think there needs to be um, a bridging of different conversation. 
um, there's a need to um, recognize and reestablish a sense of uh, balance reciprocity, um, not just in terms so that we can um, uh, just not just in terms of how others see us, but also a recognition of, of the contribution that uh, we uh, we make to the rest of the narrative. Um, there's a lot of lessons that can be um, can be shared from one place to the other, especially um, around um, uh, open education, for example, where uh, a lot of um, uh, people even here at, at UCT have uh, have led in that space. There's a lot of space, a lot of uh, um, conversation around integration of technology. There's a lot of um, of conversation and and actual examples of um, uh, of of um, what it means to be learner centered. Uh, that also needs to be um, to be shared as a way of bridging that narrative. So. Um, as a way to sort of telescope uh, what the future of this conversation is, I'm arguing that uh, we need to continue to disrupt this uh, this single narrative uh, uh, that has dominated um, by constantly sharing uh, what people are doing and then Africanizing different concepts. Because often we use a lot of the different um, learning theories that are out there or research theories that have not necessarily been designed for um, for, for our own context that we need to be to, to re-examine. Um, I think we we need to value our ways of knowing and thinking. We need to start contextualizing and culturalize a lot of the things that we do. So this for me is how I think we need to start reimagining and uh, uh, reconceptualizing and I'm hoping that once I'm done with this that everybody's can also share their version of how um, that looks like. Um, right? uh, because ultimately, in this space, we're not just consumers of ideas and the tools. Um, I like this uh, framework by Alison Druin, where um, it, it sort of sets up four different stages um, of reconceptual and reimagining this, because we use a lot of the same things that everybody else is using. Um, so we can contribute at use as users. We can contribute as testers by being able to test it in different uh, environments. We can uh, contribute as informers by being able to inform on different conversations. Um, and we can, in this way, also um, be design partners in the process. So this, for me, again, is a way that I think we can reconceptualize and reimagine the narrative. So. Just quickly to sum it up, for me, I think um, one of the things that I tend to focus on in my work is that um, instead of, um, of, 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 of internalizing the idea that uh, we are behind, what if we focus on the ways that we, are, on the ways that we can be leading? Uh, that's usually how I approach my work. Um, instead of, um, and then also asking, are we doing what needs to be done to benefit from the promises of, of, of tomorrow. One of the things that I usually focus on on that point is um, this concept of being learner-centered. Um, the concept of learner center often involves a questioning and um, a disruption of um, the teacher as the gatekeeper of information. Uh, how does that manifest itself when you are brought up in a culture like mine, where the elders are are key to everything? So then now, how do how do we how do we do that? We know that we need learners who can question, who can be creative, who can come up with innovative solutions. But a lot of that involves being able to be free to question um, your elders, which is not exactly something that um, my culture necessarily uh, promotes. I, I think we need to start edu to, to continue to question why do we educate and whose education are we adopting? Um, how is today's education preparing learners of tomorrow for our specific context? There's a lot of uh, trends and issues that, um, that are out there, but what are the trends and issues in the environment that we, uh, that we exist? Um, and lastly, I think um, we need to, con to 
I, we need to, con to not confuse having technological cap capacity with not having um, human capacity. And what I mean by that is, I, I want to emphasize here that I'm not naive to things that we, um, the context that we all work in don't have um, different challenges. But I think often in my area of research is that um, people tend to confuse maybe the infrastructure issues, uh, the capacity and capability of certain things to not being able to do that thing that they're trying to do. And that thing often is about human capacity, the ability to imagine, the ability to be able to think outside the box. Um, and I think that um, whether you have no internet in your village or not, your imagination uh, is still there. Um, and those two things, a lot of the time, we tend to confound. So I think um, the this is the last slide, really. But my goal here is just to really more advocate for us to share um, our stories. And as a way of maybe thinking um, through the conversation, is some of the closing questions that I want to leave with is um, thinking about where is the divide um, and how do you see that divide? Um, how do you bridge that divide? What do you see yourself or, or, or the context of where you work as a, as a leader? Um, where are we leading? Where can we lead? And um, how do you understand and measure creativity? And how do you promote it in your area? Because ultimately, those are the ways that I believe you're going to have to um, reconceptualize and reimagine uh, and own that dialogue around, especially um, technologies in education. So I'm going to stop here because I just really wanted to use those slides to hopefully provide some uh, talking points, and I hope we can um, have a, a dialogue. And you can feel free to tell me exactly where you disagree and you don't think it works. Yes, sir. So, Lenny, thank you very much for the presentation in terms of both the breadth and depth of your work. Um, can we pick up on some questions that have been surfacing in the online chat? Yes. OK. Um, there was a question which came from Shafley. The topic is the gospel, is the gospel or the Bible, the Bible because by Africa Africa may be regulatory states. Um, um, my favorite answer is usually it depends, I suppose. Um, because um, there is a lot of if I'm if I'm understanding correctly, is that is a question that um, the regulation that are hampering uh, no. progression. Yes, and, and um, in my own context of um, uh, in Namibia, for example, we have um, a lot of policy that are hampering the integration of these things, uh, of these tools. Um, we, we are still obsessed with the question of whether we should ban tools or not. Um, and I always like to give people an example. Like I have a little mark here, um, a black mark in my hand, because when I was a kid in grade school, a friend stabbed me with a pencil. And somehow I'm still there. Um, and that's a tool that has been used for learning. And I think somebody should ban that thing, because that thing is dangerous. Um, so you know, um, but the same thing with mobile devices, for example. A lot of my students no longer write down stuff. They take their phone out and, and take a snapshot of the board. So um, is the gospel of techno liberation uh, a possibility? Yes. Um, I'm not comfortable with the language of gospel of, uh, of techno liberation. Um, but I think, again, um, I think it definitely is possible, but we do have to address some of those challenges and figure out a way to um, uh, to, to, to tackle them. So Thank you. Another question has just come from Vincent Cabea in the yeah. chat. Yeah. Um, about being consumers of technology as a continent, how do we stop being on the consuming end? Well, I think that is already starting, really. Uh, we are um, producers. You know, I mean, I was... Um, and, and producer of the technology and, and innovation. I was just in your office looking at the, um, the OER book, right? Um, uh, that came out of the work um, 
here at the university. Um, there's plenty of tech hubs all around um, uh, different uh, parts of Africa. Uh, the one thing that I usually like to point to as one of them that a lot of people know around the world is um, uh, Ushahidi, right? Mm -hmm. So it's emerged out of Kenya and it's being used around to monitor so many things all around the world, right? Um, Ubuntu, the Linux platform, came out of South Africa, right? So there is, there, I don't believe that we are um, only consumers. And I think my argument is that that's the narrative we have to address, that we are constant consumers because we are constant producers. It's just that we're not always getting credit for the production. And there are also greetings from Monica Shitwini, yes. who is uh, also Oshibango speaking from Namibia. Sounds good. Hi, Monica. So maybe we should come back into the face-to-face -face room yes. and see what kinds of questions and comments there are here, face-to-face. I couldn't have been all that clear. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you very much, sure. uh, Mr. Manning. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, you talk about EdTech mm -hmm. um, and consumers and producers. And I wanted to ask you, now that EdTech and education technology is also considered a kind of business or market opportunity globally, yeah. whether those trends and trajectories will actually make it more difficult for um, you know, so-called locally grown solutions and businesses because yeah. like with so many other edtech um, innovations that developing countries are seen as markets mm -hmm. and that there's a lot of aggressive yeah. um, moves in that way. I, I, I do agree. I think it's going, it's going to make it very difficult. Um, I think last week or so there was um, a story online about um, Facebook and Google um, promoting their undersea cable. Um, and for me, of course, the cynical version of me, I was like, oh, that's a lot of alarm bells already. Because I'm not so sure if that's going to be beneficial to us um, in the way that we hope that it's going to make us a great new market, like you said, uh, for all these things. Um, I don't, unfortunately, that is not um, a continent specific issue. I think it's a global issue. Um, which also often I think us in education have in a way helped contribute um, because most of really looking at um, if the, the traditional education technology from instructional design to, 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 to now really, um, it started off with people designing instruction for World War II pilots to be able to learn how to fly mm -hmm. and all these type of things. And then somehow along the process we got into this idea of we're not creating stuff anymore, but we are critiquing the technology that's out there, or we're just using the technology that's provided for us. I think now there's a little bit more of an evolution around that space where you have a lot of schools having design studios and uh, uh, making spaces and so on to be able to um, train and produce uh, people who are both able to design instruction, but also able to design the technology. So I'm hoping that that will help sort of uh, um, mitigate some of that, uh, but you're absolutely right, the more all of these things come, the more um, uh, education as a whole is seen more as a, as, a, as a market that needs to be exploited for capitalistic gains. So. Quiet. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you for the discussion and the issues that you raise around um, uh, uh, academic, uh, the role of our academics in our African university context. And I'm just thinking aloud that um, um, when uh, we say we wish to reframe and uh, recenter the, the dialogue around the, the, the way we work uh, as African academics. Um, is it perhaps to maybe focus more on um, on Africanizing the curriculum, mm -hmm. um, or also it includes the other perspective as well? Because we, 
we do participate within it and enjoy our uh, environment as well. And how do we want to strike a balance and to reach um, no, you're absolutely right. Thank you for giving me that, that opportunity to actually clarify because my presentation was very ed tech focused. Um, but I think for me, it's not just that. Um, one of the areas that I'm also uh, involved in is, is the area of uh, learning sciences and uh, computer supported collaborative learning space and so on. Um, and an example I think that sort of uh, goes with what you're saying is. Um, in, in those spaces, and I would argue in education in general, we are really focused on um, collaboration as an important uh, learning outcome for, for, for our learners. Um, we are really focused on this idea of, of, of community, community of learner, community of practice, and so on. For me, when I uh, my first uh, learning science conference that I attended was in uh, was in Singapore, and I was in the room. I think I was. Um, I was one of three Africans in the whole conference. Um, two others were actually from UCT. I can't re remember the, 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 the names at this stage. Um, but as I was sitting there, most of these concepts that were being talked about are concepts that I sort of um, internalized as, as, as very African, right? The idea of community, the idea of working together. I usually joke around is that um, as a boy growing up in, a, uh, in the north in a, uh, of Namibia or Nigeria, is that I don't remember doing anything alone, right? Um, you you eat your shitima with your stew in the same. You have two plates. No matter how many people are in the house, you're eating from that same thing. Um, often you're showering together because it's not uh, necessary enough for to go around. You're doing everything together. And then we go to the classroom. You sit at your own desk by yourself with your pencil and your pen. Now. Um, Ideas in education are talking about communities and, and all these things that support, but these things we already have. Those are part of who we are. So we do need to Africanize the curriculum in such a way that it, it fits uh, who we are and, and, and how really we function. Because we also know that when you're introducing things that are not compatible with the learner, you're introducing cognitive dissonance, right? Um, that is um, is not necessarily helpful to the learner to be able to press all this information. Um, so it's not just about the technology, it's also really about reimagining what is education for and how does it fit into our context. But you're absolutely right, we also have to look at that in terms of the global uh, conversation because a lot of the stuff that we're being faced with uh, are impacting all of us at the same time around the world. Yes, sir. Just in terms of where is the divide and what is the divide, I think, um, I'm asking that question in the context of um, you mentioned education without borders, and I would assume it relates to the process of the continent itself. It's very different from education without borders globally. <laughs> and in that context, we also mentioned share what we are doing, I think the relationship between the two. So, in terms of, is there a divide in terms of the accessibility to various platforms for learning for, um, on the continent as opposed to the continent? What, what are the challenges there? You're right. I think that, yes, there are definitely um, some of those obstacles, right? Uh, that, that, like you said, are uh, platform uh, specific things. Um, for me, although those are there, um, and, and, and I don't want to minimize them as, as important challenges, but it also fits into my um, other conceptualizations that that is, um, you know, there used to be a time where, um, right now I have a, a, a Mac and I have a computer as a, as a PC. Uh, when I was in high school, we couldn't share files, right? Um, so those things end up eventually um, uh, being um, able to overcome. Um, I think. However, I do think that there's enough of accessible platforms where that can happen, right? Um, and an excellent example of that, again, my own biases, I'm going to own this, is, 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 is Emerge, right? Emerge uh, constantly engages in conversations globally um, that uh, through platforms that allow that, 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 that type of, uh, of exchanges. Um, so I think that they are there. Um, I, I don't so much know if, um, in my experience, the issue about ex 
changing has not been platform specific, has been my um, ideas as an African scholar being respected. And here's an example. I went to, um, to a Caribbean country um, with my university to, um, <coughs> to, to attend a conference and, and do some consultation. When I was introduced as somebody from, um, from Oklahoma State University, I was viewed as somebody with something and a scholar from this community. And somehow along the conversation, my dean said, oh, yes, he's, he's from Namibia. And I'm not exaggerating. The next question was, so I you guys have a lot of child marriages in Africa. <laughs> so how do, you, how, do you, how do you solve that? And now I'm thinking to myself, you know, I know a lot of things. But child marriages is not one thing that I really know. I can't, uh, you know, I can't explain that. So it's also this idea of um, of certain groups' ideas not being valued, and we see them on a continental scale. We also see them even in, in a room uh, based on gender, right? Uh, based on whatever, whoever is identified as an other, that other is going to have a tough time getting their uh, ideas respected. Um, so for me, that's that's a bigger challenge than the than the platform and technology. There have been several questions that have surfaced in the online chat. Yes. Um, but I don't think we're going to have time to answer all those questions now, but at least to register them. Okay. There's a question about the use of social media for learning and stimulating creativity, and more generally in education. Um, there is a question about where do you begin with training teachers? Yeah. And there's another question, which is where are we leading? Yeah. Up to you to pick whichever one you want. Well, the, the, the way we are leading, I'm going to leave that because that was my question. So, so someone is trying to get the teacher to answer the question. So, um, but I think the part for me that uh, I want to take is, is the social media aspect. Um, I think that's an area where um, that I, I don't see enough being explored, um, especially from um, uh, the areas uh, of Africa that I'm concerned with, that I'm interested, that I've been working with. Um, <clears throat> my colleague Tanya Lise and I edited a special issue for Tech Trend that was specifically focusing us on social media and learning, right? Um, and as a result of that, we have been able to go to different forums, sort of promoting uh, and, and examining how these things are happening. So um, I think um, but social media also has a lot of embedded cultural issues that need to be examined um, as well. Um, it's going to be very hard um, just talking about as a Namibian for Namibian government to convince our Ministry of Education to support social media in, in education because all they see is uh, the youth insulting politicians and, and what <laughs> have you. Which, of course, if you weren't doing something worth insulting you about, we wouldn't be insulting you, but that's another longer <laughs> conversation. Um, so I think that's an area definitely that um, that can be um, uh, uh, can be further examined because most of um, because social media is a is a great example of, of of how of why it's important to have different areas of the world contribute to a narrative because in most African countries WhatsApp ends up being the king right mm -hmm. uh, we all end up communicating that in a lot of Asian countries WeChat end up being the, the, the thing that people communicated. Um, in other areas, you end up having Twitter. In other areas, you end up having all these other things. So you have all these different platforms that people are using all over the place that I think we can really learn from each other about how we are using these things, how are we acting, and how are we present in, in all these things. There's a lot of schools that I hear about, um, uh, and a lot of most university lecturers, the University of Namibia, have given their students their WhatsApp numbers. So they end up contacting each other that way. Um, there's on the, that literature around how social media, things like WhatsApp is being used in education specifically in Southern Africa, for me, I think it's only starting to emerge. And it's an area that still needs to really be fully, uh, fully explored because people are using them. Um, it's just whether or not we are having a system where we can share how, uh, how they're being used and what lessons we can learn from it. 
I think. All right, I would like to check. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Tutelini. Sure. Um, I would like to check if we have any final, final, final questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In terms of what you just said, I think there's the opportunity to look at uh, transmedia storytelling as an example of how it can be transformed towards learning. And no matter how limited the platforms are available, learning is available to various platforms, dollars and social media platforms as much as possible. I, I think even without social media, still storytelling has an approach. Yeah. To That's my, my comment. I think the transmedia concept is one thing that people have missed. Uh, transmedia was a, a really big topic at one point, mm -hmm. but recently it seems to have been fallen by the wayside. Uh, and I think it's really uh, a crucial that we return to that. To that area. So I think spending time has been missed. Yeah. yeah. And they tremendous opportunity. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, thank you, people online, everybody online, for um, for joining and participating in the conversation. And everybody in the room, hopefully, it was a time well spent for your lunch. If not, feel free to send me an email and say, change your presentation. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely.